it's pairing. I still wait um, that I can see it on, on YouTube before I start. So here we are. So um, good afternoon, Europe. Good morning, United States. And good day for wherever else you are in the world. My name is Carsten Schradin. I welcome you to this fine seminar, which is the last fine of um, fall 2022. And it is actually the was finishing the fifth um, series of fine that started with the corona pandemic in um, 2020. And as such, I would like to give you a short overview of what we have been doing um, this year. And let me see um, if there's something wrong with my sharing, then please. Um, let me let me know. Oh. No, why does it not go? So here you see the program and we, we, we had this year. It was a lot of very nice and interesting talks from all over the world. Um, and we had them. Um, I, I will not go through all these talks now. I mean, you can look them up, up, up yourself also on our YouTube channel, but they're still available. But we had quite a focus a little bit on South Africa this year with them starting with Erika van der Waal, who is studying um, velvet monkeys there. We had three very young South African colleagues presenting their work. And last week, um, for me, especially fascinating talk by um, Jane Waterman about the uh, um, ground squirrels, African ground squirrels, she's studying in the arid areas of South Africa. And today, Maria Osteusen will give the second talk this term about um, mole rats and mole rat sociality. I will talk about um, Ma Maria in more detail in, in just a moment. But um, before going to this, I want to show you that we already have um, a program for the fine, the sixth season of fine. It's going to start in um in I'll put this here in 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 March we have um, lo lots of talks we already all the days are occupied there's a few where we still wait um for the confirmant by by Eduardo but it will be again a very interesting um seminar series I will send around the first announcement next week so you don't forget about the final you will get the final fine program then um, end of February 2023 for example Radio Amshari will talk about cleaner fish and, and cognition. There will be um, talks about, about primates, about eusocial teen ants, um, about rabbits, um, house mice, and, and many other interesting talks. And um, we're very happy that we find so many colleagues that, that can present and present really um, very high quality work. We also always open if you want to suggest somebody but um, i have to say at the beginning when we started 2020 we were a bit afraid do we find enough people we had a list of 50 people by then and now our list is 70 people excluding the ones we already um, invited so you have somebody to suggest you can contact us but there's no guarantee we will invite him or her immediately we will put that name on the list and then we always try to come up with a mixture of people from different countries people working on, on primates mammals birds Birds, fish, invertebrates, and so on to mix all of, of, of this up. And um, I hope with this um, strategy so far, we were able to um, give you a nice um, overview of what's happening in the field of um, social evolution. What I also would um, like to, to remind you is, um, I have to switch that down, is that we also provide the research community, or not we, but uh, many of the fine presenters um, how do I get this away? Um, I have to move that again to the other uh, screen. Um, we provide you with uh, the many of the fine presents provide you with teaching slides you can download from our um, homepage um, on different topics that have been presenting here. We have um, put it in three categories, concepts, case studies, and study systems. It's not always easy to say, is this now a case study or is it a concept? So um, it's worthwhile to look into all these three categories. So if you're teaching on animal behavior, you might find interesting um, slides here that you might be wanting to use for your teaching. And these are short summaries of the most important points of these different talks. And if you have a lot of time, you can, of course, also still watch all the finds that were recorded during um, these um, um, two years on our YouTube channel. So normally when you come there, you, you will find, find it looking like this. And when you go on, on live here, you find all the previous finds. 
And also, if you miss any this fall, you can still come here and watch them, like the one of Jane Waterman from, from last week or April Bernard do, and so on. So all of this um, is um, available. And of course, at the moment, we are here um, screening um, myself and later the much more interesting talk um, by, by Maria. And you can also... Um, watch this or, or send if, um, the, the link to this talk um, to, to your colleagues. So with this, I'm going to introduce today's um, speaker, which is Ma Maria Oesthausen, who is um, a lecturer at the University of Pretoria, one um, worldwide leading institute on memory research, where she is also at the Memory Research Institute. Maria did her um, PhD already in Pretoria and um, working on, on mole rats. Of course, everybody interested in social evolution knows that mole rats are a very important um, group of animals there. And a little bit, um, the problem is that everybody goes for the naked mole rats or the damaronid mole rats, the so-called new social species, even though if you remember Marcus Turtle's talk, he doesn't really think that at least the damaronid mole rats are new social. And people are very focused on this specific species. But to understand social evolution, of course, we have to look on the biodiversity of sociality in the animal kingdom and this biodiversity also exists within the group of mole rats and so we need people very interesting for us are people who know more than only one species but have a better overview of the entire group and this is exactly um, the case with Maria who did already her PhD on two species of mole rats a solitary one and a group living one to compare aspects of social behavior and of reproduction. Maria is um, since then studying more rats, she's um, looking at behavior, but also she's more, I'm um, also in the field of ecophysiology, like me, myself, I'm also am. Um, she also has a research focus on aspects like osmoregulation or circadian rhythms in more rats, but also in other small mammals um, living in South Africa. She has um, over the years published more than way more than 60 papers on these aspects of um, small mammal um, behavior and, and, and ecophysiology with often a focus on the different more red species. And today she's going to give us an overview of what we can learn by looking not only on one very specific more red species, but on a more diversity range of um, more red sociality and what we can learn about social evolution. Okay, with this, I hand over to um, you, Maria. Thank you very much. Uh, let me see to share my screen. Um. Okay, I see the screen. There we go. Can you see it? Looks good. Yes, I can see awesome. it. All right, so um, today I will talk about African mole rats and how their physiology and behavior differs over this continuum of sociality that is displayed in uh, the family Bathyergidae. So first I'll give some background information around mole rats, just to put the rest of the talk into context. So mole rats live on the ground. They are subterranean histricomorph rodents and they live in sealed tunnels. So they construct these tunnels by digging it either with their teeth. So if you look at this photo here, this is a Damaraland mole rat. Oh, let me get the laser. This is a Damaraland mole rat, and you can see it has a nice set of chompers. So he uses this to dig their tunnels. Um, and you can see that the feet here is quite neat. It's not really adapted for digging. But in the case of the Cape Dion Martin mole rat, so this is this guy over here, um, they also use the claws to dig their uh, the tunnels. So you can see the front claws are much larger and um, more adapted for digging. So these tunnel systems are quite organized. They consist of a number of superficial foraging tunnels and then deeper, more permanent type of highways that contains nests, sometimes food stores, and also toilet chambers. Um, so the foraging tunnels are constantly extended in uh, search of food. And when it is extended, then the mole rats kick the um, soil above ground, so then uh, it comes, well, you can see it as these mounds above ground. So the burrow lengths appear to be dependent on food availability and also the number of individuals in this uh, tunnel system. So um, the subterranean niche is quite unique and it's also very specialized, so it has some advantages and also some disadvantages. So in terms of advantages, um, it's quite a safe environment. It protects against predators. So if something wants to catch more rats, they really have to dig and make an effort. 
Um, the other thing is that it's quite a stable and predictable environment. So um, the tunnel systems are thermally buffered, so it's relatively stable barrel temperatures. But depending on the depth of the tunnels, there are still daily and or seasonal variation in the tunnels. So then in terms of um, stressors or disadvantages of uh, the subterranean niche, there are quite few sensory cues. So for example, there's no light under uh, in, in the tunnels. So they can't really um, use uh, light. So they can't see underground uh, pretty much. Uh, there's also certain sounds that are more amplified than others. Um, there's low food availability and they have to dig for it. So uh, the energetic cost of digging is quite high. So depending on the conditions in the burrow system, on the soil properties and stuff, the energetic costs can literally be something up to 3,600 times um, that of when you're just walking above ground. So the environmental conditions in the tunnels are also quite extreme. Um, you get high humidity, there's low gas ventilation, and this can cause hypercapnic and hypoxic conditions. Uh, so it's quite a, a specialized um, environment if you live in tunnel systems. So the conditions in the subterranean niche, as you can see, is somewhat extreme. So the animals that live in it also have to uh, evolve, and they've evolved a number of adaptations to survive and even thrive in this environment. So these adaptations include morphological adaptations. So for example, you can see the body shape, this guy here. It's quite a barrel-shaped body. They have short legs. They move equally fast forwards and backwards. Um, they have these large uh, extra buccal incisors, which they dig their uh, tunnels with. Um, they also have these skin flaps behind the teeth so that the, when they're digging, that the soil doesn't enter their airways. Um, so they have a lot of muscles around the neck and the, the, the head. Um, just because they dig with, with their teeth, they have small eyes, as you can see here. They don't have external ear penne. And all of the mole rats, even the naked mole rats, have sensory fabriciae. So these are um, a bit of longer hair that sticks out above their normal fur coats. Um, and this aids with orientation and um, also it increases the sensitivity to tactile cues. Um, all right, so they also have physiological adaptations, specifically to the hypoxic and hypercapnic conditions that they may encounter in the deeper tunnels. So they have high hemoglobin affinity for oxygen, also high tolerance to CO2. And then they have some regulatory adaptations, such as low body temperature, so mostly between 34 and 36 degrees. Um, they also have low resting metabolic rates and high thermal conductances, and all of these uh, adaptations are aimed at uh, prevention of overheating in the tunnels. They also have some behavioral adaptations. So uh, these are related to the digging activities. So um, they, while they're digging the tunnels, they form these digging chains. This is not a very good photo, but this is the best one I could find. So basically, you have one mole rat that actually digs in front, and then he kicks the soil uh, backwards and then it's a chain of mole rats that just kicks the soil backwards until uh, if you look on this side here until it gets um, ex excreted to, to or expelled onto the surface and then it um, uh, forms these mounds. But then in the social mole rats there are also near substrates in specific areas of the brain that promote uh, family formation and pair bonding. So African mole rats are endemic to sub-Saharan Africa. They all belong to the family Bathyergidae. There are more than 30 species in six genera. Three of these genera are contain social species and three of them contain solitary species. And in this family then, you get a continuum of sociality from strictly solitary to very highly social. So uh, if we look at the uh, solitary and the social species, so over here we have the solitary species. Um, on top here, on the, the top one here is the Cape mole rat. Um, they are quite angry animals. Here is the silvery mole rat. It's also a solitary species. And here is the Cape dune mole rat. So this is the largest mole rat. They can get up to about two kilograms in the large males. Uh, so all of these animals, uh, um, normally the social species are a little bit larger body than the social ones. They are all asocial and they are highly xenophobic. If you look on the right side, here is the social genera. So first we have the cryptomus species. Um, here is the fucumus, the, the Maraland mole rat. Um, they are quite social. And um, then the naked mole rat, which you probably are all familiar with. 
Uh, so generally, the social species are a little bit smaller bodied compared to the, the solitary ones. And so in this uh, social colonies, um, there's variation in the colony sizes. So the cryptomus species, um, it goes up to about 17 animals. It's the largest I've seen. Uh, Fukumas is getting a bit larger. So the largest colony of um, the Maralat Malrats that has been trapped is about 40 animals. And then the naked Malrat is quite a bit larger. So normally they have about 80, 70, 80 animals in the colony, but they can go up to about 300 animals. So Malrats occur in a wide range of climatically divergent habitats. So it's from mizi to arid, there's also variations in soil types, uh, so from coarse sand to fine clays um, over a range of different altitudes. It's literally from sea level up to on top of mountains, um, a range of rainfall patterns. Some live in winter rainfall areas, some in summer rainfall areas, and then obviously a different uh, a whole variety of vegetation types. So, um, the distribution of the mole rats is dictated by the presence of geophytes. Um, this is the staple diet of all animals. So they are of all the, the mole rats. They don't drink water, they get all the moisture from the food. So some of the solitary species also supplement their diet with above parts of the plants. So for example, grasses or flowers. So most of the solitary species is restricted to basic regions with high precipitation. So if you look at this map here, the Georagus, the Cape Mole Rat, is um, restricted to these areas at the southern tip of South Africa here. And then there's also isolated populations a bit higher up here. Um, but here, guys, this is the Dune Mole Rats. They have a sort of a similar situation um, distribution here at the southern tip of South Africa. And then they also go a little bit higher up um, in the west coast. The Euphobius is a silvery mole rat. They occur in uh, East Africa, so up here. And uh, then if we look at the, um, the social species, they pretty much occur everywhere. They have a wider distribution than the solitary species, and they also overlap with the solitary species over here at the bottom. Um, so if we look at the cryptomus, they pretty much occur throughout South Africa and then extend a little bit into Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Um, this gray area here, um, is the Fukumas distribution. So most of these species um, yeah, occur sort of in the Central Africa, extending a little bit into the Southern Africa. So these areas over here is sort of deserty and very dry. The Damaraland Morat occurs there. And then um, the uh, um, Heterocephalus, the naked Morat, is here in the Horn of Africa. It's also quite dry there. So the two so-called eusocial species, the Maraland mole rat and the, um, the naked mole rat, occur in quite arid regions with unpredictable rainfall. So if we look at the sociality continuum, we have the social, uh, the solitary species at one end. So they live alone. They only get together, together during brief mating periods. Um, when there's babies, the babies are picked out by the mother after they're weaned, and then they're alone again. Most of the species are social. So social species, along with the difference in calling size, they also display a bit of different level in sociality. So the ones with the smaller colony sizes usually have a bit of a looser level of sociality compared to the ones with the larger colonies. So cryptomus species here are uh, occurring fairly music areas. They have smaller colonies uh, with a more loose social organization. And the fukumus uh, overlaps a little bit with the cryptomus, so they occur in music and arid areas. They have bigger colony sizes up to also the Damara land, which is uh, quite highly social. And then, of course, the uh, naked mole rat Aetocephalus is, um, they live in very high, uh, very large colonies, and um, they are the most social mammal known um, to us. So if you look at the social structures of mole rats, obviously the solitary mole rats don't have a social structure because they're solitary. Um, all the social mole rat species breed cooperatively. So the breeding is restricted to a single female per colony. She's called the queen. And then she has one to three breeding males that she forms long-term associations with. So these breeding systems are monogamous-like. So it's monogamous-like because there is sometimes more than one male involved, but it's not like it's random males. It's the same male. So um, it's monogamous-like. Um, mole rat colonies also consist uh, mostly of family groups. So it starts off as a breeding pair and then the offspring remains in the colony as helpers. Uh, sometimes other animals can migrate in, but it's not that common depending on the species. 
Uh, so these type of breeding systems can lead to a reproductive skew, or it does lead to a reproductive skew. The queen is the only female in the colony that breeds, so um, while the subordinate animals remain in the colony, they will not breed. So filipatry is driven by constraints on dispersal, and it also then prevents independent breeding. So the more arid areas that the animals inhabit, the less opportunities they have for dispersal. So then the animals remain in the colony. So this is why the animals, uh, the colonies get bigger and then the reproductive animals have to be um, a bit more strict with their measures uh, for suppression of uh, reproduction in the subordinate animals. Right, so um, there's been a bit of controversy around the sociality as you've heard. Um, at the moment, the Maraland mole rats and naked mole rats have been classified as eusocial, according to the classic definition of the, um, having a reproductive division of labor, um, overlapping generations, and then also cooperative care of, uh, of the young. But as I said, there's quite a lot of debate whether uh, the, bar the Maraland needs to be also classified as eusocial or whether other uh, species can also be classified as uh, eusocial. But nevertheless, these two species are highly social and uh, they conform to all the requirements of um, eusociality. So the, um, the aridity food distribution hypothesis has been proposed to explain dispersal and cooperative foraging in an ecological context in the social African mole rats. So the idea is that in medic areas over here, the food is um, uniformly distributed or evenly distributed and it's much more abundant and also the rainfall is high and it's predictable. So this means that when species, uh, the species that live here um, have a low risk of unsuccessful foraging and also the cost and the risk of dis dispersal is lower. So this increases individual reproductive success. On the other hand, in arid areas, the food is a lot less abundant, it's more patchily distributed, and if you look at the bottom here, the rainfalls are low and uh, erratic. Um, so species that live in these areas have a much higher risk of unsuccessful foraging if you're a single animal that just dig blindly, because these animals dig blind for food. Um, so the cost of this dispersal is also then much higher. So um, this then makes much more sense for animals that live in arid areas to remain in the natal colonies and then forage cooperatively to increase the chance of encountering food. So this obviously then also increases the skew in lifetime reproductive success. So this is just to illustrate to you what it looks like in Namibia in winter or the dry season. So you can see why the animals cannot really disperse um, and they struggle to find food. So it's really very dry. Um, and uh, these, these soils go to, uh, turns into concrete um, in, during the dry season. Now this is the same area in the summer, in the rainy season, it's much greener. And you can also see here, there's lots and lots of molehills. So this is prime time for extending foraging tunnels and also dispersing. All right, so there are several aspects of uh, mole rat life where uh, solitary and social mole rats differ. So I've identified a few of these that they will discuss. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, reproductive strategies. There are different ways that mole rats are restricted from breeding. And then also related to their social structures, they have different neuropeptidergic contents in their brains. And then lastly, I did a small experiment um, on learning and memory, and I also found some species differences in this. So I'll also talk about that. So um, in terms of reproductive suppression, all the social mole rats exhibit a reproductive skew where the breeding animals suppress the subordinate animals. Um, so this can be either behaviorally or uh, physiologically. So to ma maintain the skew, the mole rat colonies have a dominance hierarchies. So the reproductive animals are the most dominant. They are dominant over the remainder of the colony. And usually the rest of the colony is more or less ranked according to size. So the larger animals dominate over the smaller animals. So most of the social species maintain reproductive suppression of the subordinate animals by behavioral means. So this is pretty much a reproductive animals just being aggressive towards the non-reproductive animals. So they bite and uh, kick them around. Um, subordinate animals of the highly social mole rats, so these are the, uh, the Maraland mole rats and uh, the naked mole rats. These ones are physiologically suppressed from breeding. So I'm just going to take a quick step back here and remind you um, of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal, gonadal axis. 
So if you look at um, uh, this uh, illustration over here, so GnRH is released from the hypothalamus, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, to the pituitary, where it stimulates the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone into the uh, general circulation. This then goes to the gonads. So in the testes, it still uh, stimulates sperm production and in the ovaries, uh, follicular growth. And it also uh, causes the release of um, gonadal hormones. So the gonadal hormones then feedback again to the hypothalamus and this can be either negative or uh, positive. So there are several places on this axis where one can detect whether a species have uh, the physiological potential for breeding, so whether they're physiologically suppressed or not. So firstly, we can have a look at gonadal hormones, we can look at the sperm motility and the follicular growth, also the pituitary response to GnRH, uh, for example, the GnRH challenge, and then also um, at the total GnRH content in the brain. So a species where animals are behaviorally suppressed, the subordinate animals, um, there are no difference in the gonadal hormone levels between reproductive and non-reproductive animals. The males may have slightly smaller testes, and in the females, uh, the still follicular growth uh, it does uh, take place, but it doesn't continue to the graphene follicles. So um, these graphs illustrate two species of um, mole rats. So this is the Pukamus and this is the Mishona mole rat. And here we have the uh, Natal mole rat, Cryptomus natal uh, natalensis. Um, right, so if you look on the, the left side here, um, we did GNRH challenges, well, not me, but Nigel, um, did GNRH challenges on these animals. So uh, what happened basically is uh, the, these animals received a GnRH injection and um, the circulating LH levels were measured before and 20 minutes after the injection. So uh, this, if the, um, the pituitary is responsive, then you will get an increase in LH. And this is exactly what we are seeing here. So this is reproductive males, non-reproductive males. So both in the reproductive and the non-reproductive males, there is a huge response um, and a huge increase, a significant increase in LH. The same case in reproductive and non-reproductive females. So there's always also a significant increase in LH uh, in both uh, reproductive and non-reproductive females. Um, on the uh, right side here, we have exactly the same situation. So this uh, top graph here is for reproductive, reproductive and non-reproductive males. And um, also in summer and winter, it's a uh, response all throughout. And the same thing in the females. So there's a um, significant increase in LH after the GnRH challenges. So these animals are clearly not physiologically suppressed from breeding. Um, there are no difference in the hormones between reproductive and non-reproductive animals. If we look at the Damara and mole rats, um, and first just have a look at the males. So again, in the males, there are no differences in the gonadal hormones. Um, or if you look at this graph over here in the response of the pituitary, the pituitary to a GnRH challenge, so you can see the um, response of the uh, pituitary is similar, so similar levels of LH after a GnRH challenge. Then if we look at the sperm motility over here, um, so the motility score for the non-reproductive males, which is in red, and the breeding males in red, uh, in blue, there's no difference between them. It's, it's literally exactly the same. Um, then if we have a look at the GnRH content in the brain, on the right side here is the males. So the white block here is non-reproductive animals. The black block is reproductive animals. And there's no significant difference in the brain content uh, of GnRH. So if you look at the females, the situation looks a bit different. Um, the non-reproductive females do actually have lower concentrations of gonadal hormones compared to the breeding animals. And if you look at the, um, this graph over here for the GnRH challenge, um, you will see why, because there's actually no response in the pituitary. So uh, LH is not released in response to a, a GnRH challenge. Um, so here is the, the breeding animals. You can see there's a huge um, difference between the pre and post LH levels uh, after GnRH challenge and then in the non-reproductive animals there's absolutely nothing. Um, also if we look in the 
uh, in the brain, the GnRH content. Again, here is the non-reproductive animals. Here is the reproductive animals um, in females, and you can see there's a large difference. So um, the non-reproductive animals actually have more GnRH in the brains, and this is because GnRH as uh, is not actually released; it's retained in the brain, so it does it cannot uh, cause a response in the pituitary. So in the case of the damara like mole rat, we have males that are behaviorally suppressed and then the females are physiologically suppressed. Naked mole rats, both the males and the females are um, physiologically suppressed from breeding the non-reproductive animals. So on the top left here, we have gonadal hormones. Um, the, this is testosterone, and here is estrogen, and this is progesterone. So the um, subordinate animals are always on the, the left. This is males, and this is females and females. So you can see that there are actually differences in the gonadal hormones in these animals, in the non reproductive and the non reproductive animals. If we look at the sperm motility, here is actually a huge difference between the breeding animals and the non breeding animals. The motility of the non breeding animals is much lower. And then uh, these two figures on the right shows the LH response to a GnRH challenge. And we, you can see in both males and the females, the non-reproductive animals have a significantly lower response to a GnRH GNR challenge. So um, these figures are the reproductive organs of uh, female naked mole rat uh, breeders and the non-breeders. So this shows the uterine horns, which is the spot here, and then the ovaries over there. Um, so you can see there's an enormous difference in the size of the reproductive animals uh, in the of, of the reproductive organs in the breeding animals and in the non-breeding animals. So it's clear in the naked mole rats that um, both the males and the females, um, the non-reproductive animals, are physiologically suppressed from um, from breeding. So just a quick uh, summary, in the solitary species, um, there is environmental constraints on uh, reproduction. Um, the social species have behavioral suppression exerted by the dominant and um, reproductive animals. And in the higher social species, uh, you social species, um, either the males are behaviorally suppressed and the females are physiologically suppressed, or both the males and the females are uh, physiologically suppressed. Seasonal breeding. Um, all solitary species breed seasonally. So the breeding season is associated with rainfall and food availability. Um, social species, some breed seasonally, some breed aseasonally. And we can measure seasonal breeding by monitoring hormone levels in and out of the breeding season. Also by doing GnRH challenges in and out of the breeding season and looking at the circulating allergy levels and also then um, the GnRH content in the brain over a season. So if you look at seasonal breeding in solitary species, um, here is two species. This is the Cape Dean mole rat and the Cape mole rat uh, GnRH challenges. Um, so in solitary species, the, the gonadal hormones actually do show seasonal differences. It's higher during the breeding season and lower out of the breeding season. However, if you look at these GnRH challenges, there's actually no difference in the potential for LH release. So if you look here in the summer and in the winter, they, they show a um, response, a significant response increase in LH, um, both in the summer and the winter. This is for the females, here is for the males. And we have the similar case in the Cape mole rats. So this is for females, winter and summer, and for the males, winter and summer. If we look at seasonal breeding in, uh, oh no, this is still solitary species. So um, here is brain sections of the solitary cape mole rat in and out of the breeding season. So um, this is the hypothalamus. We have the median eminence over here. Um, so this is out of the breeding season. Here is in the breeding season. And you can see that the amount of GnRH that collects in the median eminence here is similar for both of the seasons. So on the um, this side here, is um, the GnRH immunoreactive processes and uh, neurons. So also um, in and out of the breeding season. So the GnRH processes in this first graph is similar for uh, in and out of the breeding season. Here is the number of GnRH cell bodies, similar. And here is the mean area. So whether it's bigger or smaller neurons, it's also similar for in and out of the breeding season. 
So if we look at seasonal breeding in social species, um, both the uh, high felt mole rat and the common mole rat breed seasonally. So all of these blocks, the red blocks are in breeding season and the blue blocks are out of the breeding season. So on the left is the high felt mole rat then, both the males and the females show increases in uh, LH after a, a GNRH challenge. Um, inside, and uh, these are the males, uh, inside and outside of the breeding season and similar for the females here. Um, and then on the right is the common mole rat and we have a similar increase in LH in and out of the breeding season for the males and for the females. So this is actually um, significant. It might look a little bit low, but it is significant. So just for comparison, this is a social species that, um, oh no, sorry, um, I'm ahead of myself again. So here we have GNRH content in the brain, as well as the GNRH uh, containing neurons in and out of the breeding season for the common morat and the high felt morat. So these are the same two species that you've seen on the previous slide. So the common morats are the white blocks over here. And you can see both in reproductive and the non-reproductive um, females um, in the breeding season and out of the breeding season, there's absolutely no change in the GNRH content in the brain. And if you look at the bottom here, GNRH content uh, containing neuron and neuronal numbers, that's also the same. Those checkered boxes are for the, um, the high felt mole rat, and you can also see in and out of the breeding season, there's no real change. These are the breeding animals, and it's exactly the same. And here is also breeding animals, um, no, no difference at all. All right, now we're getting to the senior seasonal breeding in a social species. So this is just for comparison. Um, the Natal mole rat, Cryptomus autumnotus natalensis. So um, you can basically see this is exactly the same as the previous um, animals. These ones breed throughout the year and they have uh, a large potential um, for the, a potential for, for um, pituitary LH throughout the year in reproductive males and non-reproductive males uh, in summer and winter, and uh, same here for the females. So all the signally breeding mole rats, both the solitaries and the socials, do have the potential to breed throughout the year, should the conditions be uh, correct. For the solitary species, uh, seasonal behavior might be a constraint because uh, there, because they live in different tunnel systems, the males actually have to go and find the females. So depending on what uh, factors trigger the behavioral component of their reproduction, they might not breed. But the point is that females are not uh, physiologically constrained uh, against breeding. So um, here's a quick summary. All the solitary species breed seasonally. Some of the so solitary, social species breed seasonally, some aseasonally. All of them have the potential to breed throughout the year. Um, and the breeding is constrained by rather the environment rather than physiology. Okay, so neuropeptides. So there are extreme differences in the social behavior of the African mole rats. Um, and this has prompted some investigation in their uh, neuropeptidergic systems. So specifically neuropeptides in the brain that is associated with uh, affiliative behavior. So for example, monogamy and um, pair bonding. So the neuropeptides that have been identified as important here is oxytocin, uh, vasopressin, and the CRF system. So all of these are important in the regulation of social behaviors in mammals. So um, there have been some uh, quite interesting goal studies on species that are monogamous and polygamous, and uh, they provided quite some interesting insights as to the, um, the neuropeptides that are involved in social behaviors and how they might influence uh, these behaviors. So we also investigated this in mole rats um, to see if there are differences in solitary and social mole rats. So for the following few slides, um, these studies have compared the solitary cake mole rat and contrasted it with the social naked mole rat. So these are then on, on the ends of the sociality spectrum. So first, um, oxytocin. So several species in several species, oxytocin have been implicated in social recognition, also the formation and maintenance of monogamous, monogamous breeding pairs and parental care. Um, so then in this case, the vole studies have been quite um, influential. Monogamous and polygamous voles illustrated uh, large differences in the oxytocin system between these two groups. 
Um, so we've looked at the distributions of the oxytocin receptors as well as oxytocin immunoreceptor processes. Um, so uh, major differences have been found in the nucleus accumbens. So the top row here is the naked mole rat and the bottom row here is the cape mole rat. This first two sections here is a uh, nissel stain. So this is just to identify the areas where we're working in. Um, these middle two um, sections is uh, for the uh, receptor binding. And um, these last two graphs here, or the, the figures are for uh, oxytocin processes um, in uh, the nucleus accumbens. So this is uh, zoomed in. All right, so uh, the nucleus accumbens is over here in this red block. So you can see that in the eusocial naked mole rats, uh, oxytocin receptor binding is quite abundant through the uh, in the nucleus accumbens in both sexes. So um, these sections are all for uh, female animals, and then this small inset here is a male animal, just for comparison. So you can see that um, the binding is actually similar in the sexes. Um, in okay, so there's also quite a high density of oxytocin processes. Uh, in the nucleus accumbens in the naked mole rat. In the cape mole rat, there is nothing in the, um, in the nucleus accumbens. There's no oxytocin binding here, and then also no oxytocin processes in the um, nucleus accumbens. So the idea is that oxytocin signaling at the nucleus accumbens contributes to the formation and maintenance of pair bonds. Um, nucleus accumbens is also uh, important in maternal behavior. So oxytocin receptor binding in the nucleus accumbens is kind of expected in the naked mole rat and it is consistent with their um, social uh, organization. Vasopressin. So vasopressin affects social behaviors uh, such as parental behavior and aggression. So there are differences between solitary and social mole rats in the distribution and also the density of the V1A receptor binding, specifically in the ventral pallidum and the lateral septum. So these picture figures show uh, sections of male mole rats. Um, so here on the side, we have the naked mole rat and on the side is the cape mole rat. Again here, um, this is a female mole rat just to uh, show the comparison that the, the binding is similar in the sexes. Um, all right, so here again is the missal stains and this is the autoradiographs that shows the um, receptor binding. So the ventral pallidum, this is in this red block here. Uh, so you can see there's actually some um, binding here in the, the cape mole rat and in the naked mole rat there's absolutely nothing. So when you compare other monogamous and polygamous species, the result seems to be a little bit inconsistent. Uh, so some of the groups show similar results compared to the mole rats with the um, monogamous animals not showing any binding in the um, ventral pallidum and the uh, polygamous ones do. Sometimes it's the other way around, so it's a little bit uh, not very clear. However, the V1A binding in the ventral pallidum seems to be involved with partner pre preference as well as anxiety. So um, specifically for the anxiety, it would make sense if the cape mole rats have higher levels of V1A binding, um, because this would then tie in with the social anxiety and aggression that is shown by uh, the cape mole rats. The lateral septum, so this is again in this red block, um, we have intense V1A receptor binding in the naked mole rat and uh, less in the cape mole rat. So there's a similar type of inconsistency here with the monogamous and polygamous species, other species, um, but the V1A receptor binding uh, in this area seems to be related to alloparental care. So in this case, it would also make sense that the naked mole rats would have higher levels of V1A um, binding here. CRF system. So the CRF system has been shown to influence quite a large number of social behaviors. So aggression, submission, um, affiliation, pair bonding, also parental care. So it's quite a large number of um, behaviors that it influences. So the CRF system involves four ligands. Uh, it's CRF and Eurocortin 1, 2, and 3. And between these four ligands, I have two receptors, CRF1 and CRF2. So CRF and Eurocortin 1 binds to CRF1, and then all the Eurocortins bind to CRF2. 
So the naked morads and the cape morads differ in both the CRF1 and CRF2 bindings in the um, nucleus accumbens and the lateral septum. So these four plates here on the left again is naked morads. This is the nissel stain, and this is the autoradiographs for the um, uh, the receptor binding. Um, same story in the cape um, morads, and the top one is for CRF1, and here at the bottom one is for CRF2. All right, so if we look at CRF1 binding, um, the naked morad show much lower receptor binding in the nucleus accumbens, which is uh, down here in the red block, uh, compared to the, um, the cape morad. Uh, so these findings are similar to other monogamous and polygamous voles. Uh, so the high CRF1 binding in the cape morad is thought to uh, contribute to intolerance to uh, conspecifics. Then CRF2 shows also an intense binding in the lateral septum, which is uh, this part over here in the naked morad. Uh, no, in the cape morad, and it's uh, almost nothing in the, um, the naked morad. So CRF2 binding promotes anxiety related behaviors in mice. So the lower levels of CRF2 binding in the lateral septum is uh, thought to promote uh, social interactions and cooperative behavior in the naked morad. And um, the high binding in the Cape Morad um, is to increase intolerance and anxiety in the Cape Morads. Quick summary oxytocin then promotes pro social behavior, such as monogamy, pair bonding, maternal behavior. Uh, so, you social naked Morad shows abundant oxytocin binding in um, the nucleus accumbens, while the Cape Morad shows none, uh, which is obviously consistent then with the social structures. Vasopressin in the ventral pallidum um, causes social anxiety. Uh, so this explains the high density in the cat mole rats. Um, in the lateral septum, the binding is associated with alloparental care. So this again explains the higher levels in or P1A binding in the naked mole rats. The CRF system is involved in the stress response. So binding at these receptors promotes anxiety-related behaviors. So the naked mole rats have low or no binding at these sites. Uh, which agrees with their high level of sociality and tolerance towards conspecifics, and then it obviously has the opposite uh, opposite effect in the um, you know, Cape Morads. Okay, then lastly, um, learning and behavior. So I became interested in learning and behavior of the Morads because of the disparity in the tunnel length and also the difference in complexity between the solitary and the social Morads. So solitary morads mostly have relatively short tunnels that are not very complex, while the social species can have quite extended and very complex tunnel systems. Uh, so that the Maralat morads can have tunnel systems up to uh, like over two kilometers long. So since it's dark underground and I cannot see, they can't use vision to navigate. So I had the idea that they um, might have to remember better um, if they want to navigate their tunnels. Right, so um, I compared two species of mole rats, solitary cape mole rat and the social damaralat mole rat. Both of these were wild trapped. So I first looked at explorative behavior just to ensure that one species isn't like way more active than the other one or more explorative and uh, be, uh, differences would be because of that. And um, then I tested spatial memory in a simple Y maze. So here is my... Um, testing apparatus for the exploratory behavior is basically a box with three pipes extending to the side. Uh, these pipes are closed. And um, then I just put the mole rats in there and left them for three minutes. And I measured the latency to enter the first pipe, uh, total entries into the pipes, total and mean time that they spent in the pipes, and also the number of pipes visited. Uh, so I have a small video to show you what to do and if it works. Yes, okay. Um, all right, so this is a Cape Morat, um, and the three pipes extend here to the bottom. As you can see, it disappears into a pipe there. Uh, so the animal had basically three minutes to walk around and to explore. Uh, this one is actually quite active. I also had some animals that, as soon as you put them in, they ground into a tunnel and it just stayed there for the entire duration of the experiment. Okay, so you can see basically um, what the animal is doing. So I might just stop this video here. 
Um, all right, so this is the results um, of the time measurements. So the yellow bars here are the Cape Mole Rats and the green bars are the Damaraland Mole Rats. So there is really no difference in explorative behavior, any of the measures in um, either of the species. So um, they were about equally exploratory. Then um, spatial learning. So this was my apparatus. Um, so it's basically the maze had three arms and it had three tunnels extending from each of the arms. So one of the arms, or one of these tunnels were an open tunnel um, and two were blocked. Um, I added a little bit of water at the bottom of the maze just to motivate the animals to try and escape, just to get them moving. So this um, experiment had a duration of one minute. Each animal had 10 trials per day over four days. And then I measured the time to get to the escape hole and also the wrong turns. Uh, so I have more videos here. So this is also a Cape Mole Rat. This is on the first day, the first trial. Um, so this... Um, tunnel in the top right hand corner is the escape hole you can see the water in here I had to add the water because uh, initially when I started these experiments I didn't have the water and then some of these animals just decided they don't want to do this experiment and they sat in the corner and just fell asleep um, all right so these these other two tunnels are blocked off you can see that this animal is quite unsure it doesn't quite know where to go It's already back into the first arm again. And here it will find the correct arm now. And there it goes. It took exactly one minute to get in there. So this is the same animal on the fourth day, um, one of the last trials. And you can see it's much quicker. It finds a tunnel in, in much less time. Right, so here we have the results. Um, here is for the latency to find the, the nest box. So um, let's get this thing back. Uh, so, so the green line is the Damaraland mole rats and the blue line is the Cape mole rats. Um, the the Damaraland mole rats literally had a little bit of trouble finding the escape box on the first day and immediately on the second day there was a significant difference in the uh, a significant re significant reduction in the amount of time that it took to to find the hole and then it remained constant the cape mole rats took a little bit longer to learn so it had a slight reduction on the second day but only on the third day here there was a significant difference uh, between the time that it took for on the first day and then um, on the third day and then it remained more or less constant so the Damaraland Morads learn a little bit faster if we look at the number of wrong turns that these animals made. Um, the Damaraland Morads didn't really make any mistakes. Um, the Cape Morads were much more erratic and um, yeah, you can see also the error bars here. There were a, a large variation between the animals and um, yeah, it also went up and down. Okay, so just a quick summary then here. Um, species differences, there's no difference in exploratory behavior. Uh, yeah, the Cape Mole rats land slower, and this might be as a result of the differences in the tunnel complexity because the Cape Mole rats has uh, less complex tunnel systems, it's also shorter, so they don't really need to uh, learn tunnels in the field. Uh, whether this has some biological implications is debatable, but yeah, so this was what I found. Um, then in conclusion, um, I've given you a brief overview of the differences in reproductive suppression, the neuropeptides in the brains, and also the learning behavior. Uh, so this was by no means very comprehensive in terms of the differences between or over the spectrum of uh, sociality. Um, I just I didn't have time to fit in more things here. Um, there are also other aspects where the animals show a spectr spectrum of differences um, along their behavior, for example, the circadian system. Um, 
But I hope that I've convinced you that mole rats are very interesting and they're quite awesome animals. Um, and that there's uh, still a lot of scope for comparative studies in this family. Um, all right, so I think I will stop here. Uh, just some acknowledgements, Nigel Bennett. Um, I've worked quite closely with him for many years. Uh, also his colleagues and some students, Clive Cohen also have worked with him for a long time. Um, also some of his colleagues and students, Chris Fox and um, Irem Gant Amrain from uh, Switzerland. And thank you for listening. Yes, thank you very much, Maria, for a fascinating talk with so many different aspects. It's nice to hear something about more more red species than just the two more or less famous ones, and also learn something about evolved mechanisms that might be related to the species differences in um, sociality. So we start um, the discussion, and like always, if you want to ask a question, please type a question mark into the chat, then I will call you up and then please first say your name and also say where you're from, what you're working on. So we know each other a little bit um, well. And for the people on YouTube, you can also write um, questions in the um, discussion in the chat function on YouTube and we will later bring it up here in the Zoom discussion. So the first question comes from Maren. Hello, my name is Maren Hook. I'm from the University of Derby in the UK. And thanks very much for your very interesting talk and the fascinating study system. Um, given that you have looked at brains anyway, have you had a look at the size of the um, hippocampus? Because I, I don't know much about neurobiology, but I think the hippocampus is related to spatial memory. So, um, and I, I know there is a study on the hippocampal formation in some in different bird species that cache food or don't cache food and where they found that um, the caching species the larger hippocampal formation and that something similar can be expected for mammals. So based on that, I would then expect that the Cape Mole Red has a smaller hippocampus than the, the Maryland. Um, I actually did also look at neurogenesis in this animal. So we have looked at the, um, the hippocampus. The type of the mole rats in general do not actually have larger hippocampus than um, other rodent species, um, which is a bit surprising. Uh, but it's, I think it's actually a little bit smaller. Um, but the formation, uh, obviously, it, it looks pretty much similar. We did also look at uh, neurogenesis specifically um, because. Um, it's involved in, in memory, but the problem with these animals are uh, neurogenesis. They, okay, so firstly, the animals live very long. So um, I, I'm sure you all know that the naked mole rats, I think the record is now something like 38 years for an animal that is about, I don't know, it's about 60 grams. It, it's about the size, a little bit larger than a mouse, and they just live forever. Um, so the other solitary, the other uh, mole rat species don't live as long, but we've had animals for 15, 16 years in the lab. Um, so they are very long lived. The problem with neurogenesis is that it declines with age. And the, the second problem is that if we catch these animals from the wild, we don't know what age they are. Um, so I did look at neurogenesis, I actually had it in my presentation and then I took it out again. Um, there's no difference between these, the number of um, granule cells or new neurons or um, proliferating cells in the two species that I've looked at with the same experiment. But uh, yeah, given all these problems, you really cannot tell. Also, neurogenesis is because they're so long lived, it's quite low. Yes, I would have been surprised if Irmgard in Zurich wouldn't have also wanted to look at the hippocampus. But I mean, even though. Yes. Yes, that's that's what I mean. I would have been surprised if you, if you wouldn't have information on this. But um, I mean, these tunnel systems might look a little bit complex to us, but compared to the complexity, let's say, of a striped mouse, who can run in so many different directions in the field and has a large home range, maybe it's not so surprising that uh, um, the mole rats have smaller hippocampi because, I mean, they can only go their roads. They cannot, like a, like a mouse, run any direction. Well, yeah, know. that's true. The thing is also with mice, when uh, well, any above-ground animals, they can also use vision for navigation, which the mole rats cannot do. 
because it's completely dark in the tunnel. So, um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, they are confined to the tunnel. So they, uh, I suppose if it gets very, some of these tunnels, um, they're getting multi-layered and they really get very complex in the social species. Um, so I guess it might start getting problematic if they can't find the nest or the food. Yeah. Okay, then we have a question by Clara. Hi, uh, I appreciate your talk. I'm sorry for coming a little late. Clara B. Jones, uh, Retired Social Evolution. Um, I have two quick questions. First of all, um, and you may have covered this, a question about your methods. I assume you're not sacrificing animals and grinding up brains. So how are you getting your data on the uh, hormone assays in the brain? And secondly, uh, when I read the uh, social insect literature, juvenile hormone comes up over and over and over again. And I wonder if you have any speculation about the role of JH. JH in the mole rat? Is there juvenile hormones in uh, mammals, for example? I think there is. Not Do you that have... I'm aware of. No, I'm I don't know anybody. I, I don't think they have juvenile hormone. I've never heard of it in any mammalian context. I know that uh, insects do have it. Um, yeah, so as far as I know, they don't have juvenile hormone. I don't know if anybody else in the audience might know. No, I don't okay. think. As I said, the reason I brought it up is that it comes up over and over again in the uh, social insect literature related to uh, sociality. But maybe it's not a good question. Um, okay, I can ask your, uh, answer your other question uh, about uh, how we did the GnRH content in the brain. Uh, we did actually kill the animals and grind up the brains and um, measured it then. Thank I you. I didn't personally do it, but some of my colleagues did. But yeah, for all the brain sections and all the, the neuropeptide stuff, you have to have brains. So you have to kill the animals and um, section the brains. Thank you. Yeah, I think the juvenile hormones in the insects is very important for change. I don't know how it's called in English. So I missed the vocabulary for change when they change the skin and go from one stage to the other. Metamorphosis. So, yeah, it's not only met, I mean, it's not, it's all these steps in between, not, mm -hmm. the, not the last one. The last one is the highest. So it would have been to do most closely with mammals and with, with, um, with the steroid, with the sexual steroid hormones, which uh, Maria. Um, I'm looked at. Um, I have a very um, basic question. Like at the beginning, you said the solitary species are highly xenophobic, so aggressive against animals they don't know. How are all of them like this? And how do you compare this to the social species? Because I guess, I mean, I have this problem always with all people working on, on with this question. When you put to a social species a stranger, they're normally also extremely xenophobic. I guess if you put a stranger into a the Maraland or naked mole rat colony, it won't survive that long either. Or how how can one make this conclusion that there's a difference? Um, well, the solitary species are really very aggressive. So they, if you put animals together, males and females, or actually any animals, um, and if it's not in the breeding season, they will kill each other. Uh, we've had that in the lab where animals accidentally fell into cages, they kill each other. Um, for the social species, it depends on the species. So the cryptomy species are normally a bit more aggressive. So even when you catch them and you want to compile the colony again, so if you have the first animal, as soon as you put the second animal in, they start fighting. Um, it takes a little, like 10 minutes, and then they settle down. Um, the Maraland mole rats, um, they are a lot calmer. I am not, I don't have that much experience with the naked mole rats, but for example, the Maraland mole rats, um, if you insert, for example, a small animal um, in a colony that is sleeping in a corner, they can just walk in there. They don't even notice it. 
So if you have a large female, for example, that can challenge the queen, then it's a different story. So she goes around, and I've also seen this, uh, bites and kills everything on the way to the queen and then challenges her and uh, try to take over. So it depends on the type of animal or the size of the animal and the social status of the animal that you introduce. If you put in a small animal, I've seen it, they just walk in, they don't even care. Okay, then I have a second question. Also on something basic that you mentioned and where you for sure you have, have some proper information is in the, um, I think it was the Damaraland more right, where you concluded um, sexual suppression in females is physiological, while in males, because they don't differ, it's behavioral. So how do you how do you know that there's behavioral suppression in the male Damaral and mole rats? Um, well, they don't breed. So there has been extensive paternity studies showing that there's really only what they are genetically monogamous. Um, no. The, the, okay, so yes, there has been. So yes, you are also correct that um, physiological uh, behavioral suppression is probably not um, the best way to describe it. It's just it's not um, physiological because you do sometimes there has been paternity studies where it's been found that these sneaky smaller males jump in when the bigger ones are fighting and um, they then breed with the female. Okay, yeah, but I mean, especially in the Samaralin more rats, they're normally close related, uh, the subordinate males to the breeding female. So it's even um, the inbreeding suppression that would keep them away from breeding. Is, isn't, isn't that to be expected? Um, there is insect avoidance. Um, I'm not quite sure if you would, were to take an animal out of the colony and it doesn't smell like that colony anymore and you would put it back whether we'd still recognize it as kin. So I'm not quite sure um, in my mind how animals would recognize who is kin and who is not. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yes. Not really. Um, no, no, it's 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 okay. I'm just just thinking. I mean, it's difficult. I mean, to to I mean, these are always things people generally assume, but to really test them is 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 a much more difficult thing. One would have to to test them in a new situation. Of course, the males would be ready to mate. That's the important mm. thing. So, I mean, uh, the question is, but I think also Nigel discusses this in his paper: Is it really suppression, or do they just not breed because it doesn't doesn't make sense, especially the males? And also the females, the cycling. But let me go on. There's a question by um, Anna Marie. Yeah, hi. My name is Anna Marie van der Maro. Um, I'm a postdoc at uh, Catholic University in Santiago, Chile. And I have kind of a question more about like um, like environmental constraints are very like um, important for these mole rats. And in light of like climate change. Do you see kind of like, can you kind of like explain the trend with the population dynamics in these different species? Um, yeah, the thing is that although the animals are quite um, buffered under the ground, so they're buffered from temperature changes, uh, light pollution is not really a problem for them because obviously they don't have contact with it. But um, also, uh, obviously if the environment on top of the ground will change, and it will significantly change the, um, the vegetation and the food supply will go down, then I think it will affect the animals. So it depends, um, I think, more on the type of the rainfall. So Karsten and I talked about this um, just before uh, the talk. There's a species of um, mole rat that occurs. It's a solitary species that occurs in quite arid areas. Um, we've had a drought now and um, a colleague of mine went down there, he couldn't find them, so they're just gone. So, um, yeah, it depends on, on rainfall, I think, primarily. So it's the rainfall patterns and the vegetation changes. Obviously, their food's going to change. Um, the soil consistency will change, so they will not be able to dig as easily, dispersal. So, um, yeah, it can, it can change. Um, I guess it depends on where, where these animals occur. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you.
Okay, then we have a common question by Stan. Hi, uh, Stan Browdy. Uh, I also work on Naked Mole Rats. Um, I just wanted to say it's, it's a delight to see the sociality and solidarity can, uh, compared within the bathyergity because when you know extraordinary things are described for naked mole rats, they're always compared to lab mice. And, mm -hmm. it, and we've argued for some time that that's a, a, an inappropriate comparison. So I, I'm just delighted to see the comparisons within the bathyergity. Um, and also I suspect, I'm gonna do this tomorrow, but I suspect as I, as I look at your data and then compare the solitary species to the lab mice, it will highlight even further how inappropriate it is to compare naked mole rats to lab mice, as opposed to what you're doing, which is to compare them to other bathyergids. So I just wanted to thank you for that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, these animals are so different from above ground species. Uh, so it's almost like comparing lab mice to humans. Um, yeah, it's almost in, in, my, in my mind, almost a similar type of comparison. It's just such a huge gap. Okay, so extending on this, this comment, if you Let's imagine uh, you would have enough time and research money to do whatever you want to do. Would you focus on detail on a very unrepresented species, like maybe a solitary species, or what, what study would you like to do where you compare between a, a huge number of the, the more red species? If, if you could now just dream that, that you get a big grant and can do for five years whatever you want. Oh, there's so many things to do on more rats. Um, well, I guess I would try to also um, incorporate some of these species that are understudied. So, for example, the, the Fukumus study, the Fukumus um, animals, a lot of them occur higher up in Africa. I know there's a, a, a group, obviously, in, in the Czech Republic that works quite extensively in um, these animals, but they do um, more sort of behavioral studies. That it's not really comparing the um, reproductive physiology of these animals. So I think I would like to just see how, to what extent these other Fukuma species um, compare with the Tamaraland Morat because they are kind of so well studied and we know almost nothing about the rest of the animals. And that reminds me, I think what you did not mention, if, if you know, you talked a lot about reproduction in this talk, is there a difference in litter size between the species or is that more or less the same between the solitary social and high social? Oh, no, there's huge differences. Um, so for the Fukumus and the Cryptomus, um, I think those females only have six mammary glands. So um, litter sizes, the largest I've seen is four, uh, no, it's six. Um, normally, it's between sort of two and four animals. The solitary species, um, the Cape Morat can, I've seen 13 animals, 13 babies. I'm not quite sure about the Dune Morat. Um, the ones that I've seen is about four. The naked Morats can have up to 20. They have, um, I think Stan will be able to tell better, but uh, I don't have too much experience, but they have a lot. Okay, so there seems to be no direct relationship there between, the, it's not like it increases from solitary to social. No. You know, social, there must be other variables explaining this. Do you have an explanation why, I mean, one, one couldn't see that, well, but some of these solitary species are very, very huge. Do you have mm -hmm. an idea what, what's the advantage of being being so big? I mean, they, they are they're like nearly like, like little marmots. <laughs> yeah, they're like a small rabbit without yeah. ears. Um, I don't really know. It's not a habitat constraint because they occur sympathetically um, with both the Cape mole rat, which is about, I don't know, a quarter of the size, and also the common mole rats, which is a lot smaller again. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know. 
Yeah, there's still lots of um, fascinating things about these animals we 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 don't we don't understand. It, it could be some evolutionary, um, you know, tree that they they evolved earlier, uh, or they broke away earlier from the the rest of the, the mainstream mole rats because they also the dean mole rats they dig with their their feet as well, um, so they they are a bit different than the other mole rat species the, apart from their size. Um, they're probably the, the largest totally subterranean mammals, are they? I mean, of course, some that, like mammals that also go foraging outside are bigger, but from the ones that live permanently below ground, they might be might be the largest even. Probably, but also these things come above ground um, more frequently than the social species. So um, you do sometimes drive around, and um, I've had people tell me that they they... They walk over the road and they bump into them and some so they they do come above ground um okay so maybe that means they have less maybe they, they have some foraging happening above ground at least part of the year and that could explain why it's then of advantage against predators for example to be bigger which is an advantage you don't have when you live below ground yeah there's also um theories that these animals also disperse above ground um, but the, the solitary ones, specifically the dune mole rats, when we have them in the lab, we feed them grass. So they definitely eat above ground um, parts of the plants as well. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Are there there's still time if there's any other questions? I quickly have a look on YouTube, but I think there is um, only Daniel Ola Sabal says it was a very great talk. Great congratulations. But I don't see any questions here. If there's still something, and also here in the chat, people, thank you for your talk and say that it was great. So I will um, one last time remind you of um, the um, the program that's coming up. Wait, me, let me have a look. I put this. I put it on on um, on. Um, yeah, also to remind you, you can you can have a look um, on our um, Mastodon account and the program is here. You don't, don't really see it, but it's there'll be lots of interesting talks. I send this program around um, next week, the, the first time, and um, then hope to see all of you again um, beginning of March. And now I will look if in the meantime, somebody um, was coming up with a with question. Now it's only what I see people congratulating you for your presentation. So with this, I'm going to um, stop the live screen and would still like to thank you again for a very nice last fun this fall. And also thank all the participants, the people that regularly come to fun and contribute um, to the discussion. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that I think we are quite happy that we can meet once a week to hear international talks on such a diversity of study systems, but still all related to social evolution. And this just shows how interesting and fascinating